is it time to revise substantially, overhaul even, the U.S. Constitution? So, just a little bit about the Constitution, kind of an overview, right? So the U.S. Constitution was drafted and uh, written in 1787. And while it has been amended multiple times, it has never been re-examined in its entirety. Uh, if you recall your U.S. history, you will note that uh, 55 men attended the Constitutional Convention. Of those 55, 39 signed the actual document coming out of the convention. Uh, then it was ratified, so each state called a specific convention in that state to, uh, to approve or disapprove of the Constitution. And so uh, that took uh, up uh, the total delegates to those conventions. 1,071 voted to approve it. Uh, 577 voted to against it. So again, that's across those 13 uh, states uh, at the time. So uh, as you can see, just a little over 1,600, not quite 1,650 uh, people who voted on the Constitution in 1787, or 1788 to be precise. The Constitution, right, sets up a framework of multiple governments. So this is one of the first things that I try to explain to uh, students is we don't have one American federal government. We have multiple American governments. Uh, and if we just want to think of those in broad terms, we have a national government, we have state governments, and we have a variety of local governments. So. Uh, this is one of the first frameworks uh, that the Constitution uh, kind of recognizes. And while you won't find that word federalism in the Constitution, uh, it is certainly talked about in the Federalist Papers, uh, and the concept is certainly recognized uh, that there will be different governments with different responsibilities. Now, within those systems, right, um, each of those governments have a framework of the separation of powers, or uh, three branches of government you might think of, right? So you have the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. That is true at the national level with the presidency, Congress, and the uh, courts. Uh, and it is true at most, at all state levels, you have the same three uh, division of powers. Uh, and then even at local levels, there is some division. The, while at the local level, those, those lines are not as clear, they still have distinct powers. And so if you go to municipalities, you have generally municipal courts, all right? You have a mayor who's considered kind of the executive, and then you have a city council that is the legislative body for the municipality. Um, this system that's created by the Constitution is a rather elaborate system that entails the division of power between multiple governments and multiple institutions in those governments. And while the system relies on majority rule for most decision making, the system is designed to constrain the majority uh, through a variety of different mechanisms. Uh, one of those mechanisms being that uh, separation of powers that we mentioned earlier, uh, giving each branch the ability to slow down, if you will, or to constrain the power of the other branches in some significant way. Another restraint on uh, the majority is the amendments that we've had, primarily the Bill of Rights, which uh, limits the majority's ability to force people into adhering to certain religions or to uh, expressing views with which they don't uh, agree, uh, those types of things, preventing the government from arbitrarily arresting people and throwing them in jail without a trial. Uh, so those are also constraints on the Constitution. Speaking of uh, the amendments, uh, so the Constitution has been amended formally 27 times. Um, however, uh, the first 10 amendments, what we refer to as the Bill of Rights, were all ratified in 1791. Uh, the, what we refer to as the Civil War Amendments, which is Amendments 13, 14, and 15, were all adopted between 1865 and 1870. 
Uh, and the 21st Amendment repealed a prior amendment, the 18th Amendment. That would have been the Prohibition Amendment. Uh, so if you make adjustments for that, you get down to, rather than 27 amendments, something more along the lines of about 16, 15 to 16 amendments. The last amendment uh, ratified by, uh, for the Constitution was passed, the 27th Amendment passed in 1992. So it's been over 30 years since we have made any significant alteration to uh, the U.S. Constitution. The Constitution itself identifies, gives us two ways through which we can amend that document. Uh, the first way is the only one that we've used since we've had the Constitution. Uh, it says that whenever two-thirds of the House and two-thirds of a, the Senate vote to approve a specific amendment, that amendment is then forwarded to the states, and the states, either through their legislatures or through specifically called conventions, will then vote to ratify or approve that document. Uh, or that amendment. And so uh, that is the only mechanism that we have used, again, since we have had the Constitution to approve any constitutional amendment. It's a pretty high bar, two-thirds of Congress, and then three-quarters of the states. So that amounts to about 38 states with the 50 that we have currently. The Constitution also provides for a second mechanism by which we can amend the Constitution. It says whenever two-thirds of the states petition Congress for a convention that Congress shall call a convention. So uh, the language there is not optional. It doesn't say Congress may. It says Congress shall call a convention. And that word shall is re regarded as a mandate. And so uh, whenever two-thirds of the states petition Congress for a convention, Congress shall call a convention. That convention would then would come up with whatever proposals to amend the Constitution uh, and then those proposals are again forwarded back to the states and you again must have that three quarters of the state's approval process for anything from that convention to be ratified and to become part of the Constitution or a new Constitution if it was so inclined to rewrite one. Uh, this particular piece or mechanism was considered at the time a, a way of getting around perhaps a Congress that was not or was reluctant, overly reluctant, to uh, move on an adoption or a change to the Constitution that the public wanted or that the state governments felt was needed. Uh, and so this was a, a mechanism to get around those problems. So when we think about altering or revising the Constitution, there are a couple of arguments, or two or three arguments that, that are the primary arguments against doing so. You're probably familiar with some of these. One of those is, well, we would risk losing the rights that are enshrined in that document currently, and, and most specifically, those that we see in the Bill of Rights. Right? And so the fear is that a convention could come in and whether you are someone who is adamant about free speech or adamant about gun rights or want to restrain the government's ability to uh, arrest people uh, without going through a proper process, uh, you are fearful that changing the Constitution dramatically in some way would risk those rights being stripped out of the Constitution. And so this is one of the, the main arguments about uh, revising it is that you would have this, this problem. Some people think it would be a probability depending on the amendment you're talking about. Others think that it would at least be a possibility and they don't want to risk that. A second argument against the convention is that it could not be constrained in what it considered or in the approval process that it arranged, right? And we'll talk more about this. This arises from how the first Constitutional Convention uh, played out. Uh, but there's nothing in Article 5 that says a convention can be restricted to a particular topic or set of topics. There's nothing in Article 5 that says uh, it must, it cannot alter the approval process. And so there are a lot of people who are concerned that you would have what often you will hear is a runaway convention, a convention that does something completely unexpected by the people who uh, sent delegates to it. And so, uh, again, this is one of the main arguments against having a constitutional convention. 
A third one uh, revolves around the vagueness of Article 5. So some things that Article 5 does not tell us. Number one, where would such a convention be held? Right? It gives us no uh, definitive location. In fact, most of the logistics of holding a convention are not identified in Article 5. How would delegates be chosen? Right? And so uh, would the state legislatures appoint delegates to this convention? Would they be elected by the people? Would the governor appoint folks? There's nothing in Article 5 that says, explains how that process would work. Uh, also, there is nothing about how would delegates be apportioned to the states. In other words, would every state get equal representation in this convention as occurred in the first constitutional convention? Or would representation in the convention uh, be based on the population of the states as Congress is now constructed, as the Electoral College is constructed? Uh, would population de uh, determine the number of representatives that a state get. This was a very contentious issue uh, at the Constitutional Convention. Uh, it would be no less contentious, more than likely, at, uh, at a new convention as well in discussing calling for one. So those have been the three main arguments against holding a convention. I'll throw in one other, which uh, again revolves around Article 5, which is what Article 5 says, as I mentioned earlier, is whether two, when two-thirds of the states petition Congress for a convention, Congress shall call a convention. Well, 49 of the 50 states have petitioned Congress at some point in time for a convention. Uh, so we've well met over the, uh, the two-thirds requirement. So how has Congress avoided doing that? Again, because of the vagueness of the language. It doesn't say do all of those have to be uh, called within a certain time frame. So if you, if you count all of them, you get to that 49, you have to go back to like 1789, 1790. Are those still matter? Should we be counting those? If you don't, then you start dropping the, the number of states who've petitioned. It also doesn't state whether or not uh, the states have to petition Congress for a convention on the same subject matter, right? And so if I have a state that petitions Congress for a balanced budget amendment, and I have another state that petitions Congress for a, a, an amendment over taxes or over uh, civil liberties or civil rights in some shape, but they're not all on the same topic, is Congress obligated to call that convention? Article 5 doesn't say. And so it's been able to use this vague language to avoid calling convention when the strict language, that two-thirds, certainly has been met uh, over time. All right, so what about arguments for having a constitutional convention? Well, let's start with probably what I think is perhaps the strongest, at least philosophical, argument for doing so, which is that constitutionalism, that idea of specifically delineating the role of government and the limits as well as the powers of government, is part of a larger philosophical vision that we call self-government, right? The notion that the people ought to be the owners and creators of their own government. As James Madison said in Federalist number 46, the federal and state governments are in fact different agents and trustees of the people, constituted with different powers and designed for different purposes. The people ought surely, ought not surely to be precluded from giving most of their confidence where they may discover it to be most due. So in other words, where the people think certain powers ought to belong, they ought to have the ability to place those powers in those particular hands, whether that's the national government or the state governments. And a constitution should not preclude the ability of the people to uh, change their minds over time if they find, if their experiences find that one level of government isn't performing uh, certain responsibilities as well as they think another level can. Along these lines, no one living today had any hand in writing the Constitution. All right? And many of our citizens were not even alive when the last amendment was ratified. In fact, if you just go back to the 20th Amendment, those who were born at that time are now over 90 years old. 
So very few of us have had an opportunity to significantly put our input into this document, right? The most recent amendment, the 27th Amendment, was, was ratified in 1992. The 26th Amendment, which is the amendment most near my birth date, I'm a little bit older than that, don't tell anybody, all right? But uh, the, the, the 26th Amendment was ratified in 1971. The 20th Amendment, way back in 1933. And so, as you can see, not a whole lot of us have had a significant opportunity to weigh in on this document that, that structures our entire system of government. We've had no significant input on that. A second reason that we might consider for having another convention is that the issues facing individuals today and society are much different than those that were facing society and individuals in 1787. The technological and social changes that have occurred place pressure on a document that was not designed to address those particular types of changes. For example, we're a much more diverse society than we were in 1787. Government surveillance technology is much more sophisticated and has a much more ability to monitor individual behavior and action than it did in 1787. And the issues relating to the separation of powers often need greater clarification. Over the last hundred years or so, that line of separation has blurred somewhat, uh, and it might be time to revisit those. Another argument for revising the Constitution is the revision, revising the document is actually in keeping with the vision of those who created the original Constitution. Elbridge Gerry, one of the uh, men at the Constitutional Convention, said that the novelty and difficulty of this experiment requires periodical revisions. Thomas Jefferson, who was not at the convention, uh, but uh, was in communication with people relating to it, uh, said some men look at constitutions with sanctimonious reverence and deem them like the Ark of the Covenant, too sacred to be touched. But laws and institutions must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind. And George Washington, who presided over the Constitutional Convention, said the people can as they will have the advantage of experience on their side, decide with as much propriety on the alterations and amendments which are necessary as ourselves. Let's look at some of those arguments against having one, the runaway convention. Well, as I mentioned, we'll come back to that. The original convention was a runaway convention. That convention was not called to rewrite a system of government. It was called to revise the Articles of Confederation. That was the purpose of that convention. On day one, they said, that's not what we're doing here. They said, you can slap all of the duct tape and the barbed wire you want on the Articles of Confederation. They are broke beyond repair, and we're going to do something different. And immediately, uh, the Virginia Plan, which was largely drafted by James Madison, uh, was introduced, which created the foundation for most of the arguments over the Constitution. Uh, was kind of the working document that they worked from. Uh, shortly after that, about two weeks after that, the New Jersey Plan was introduced as a counterproposal, uh, and the, away they were off, rewriting the entire system of government. Not only did they rewrite the government, they rewrote the rules for how this would be approved, right? The convention, as it was called, would present whatever amendments it would come up to, to the existing Congress at the time, and the Congress would vote whether or not to approve them. The framers of the Constitution said, that's not a process that's going to work, and so we changed the rules. We said we're going to instead send this document to the states, the states as individual governing entities will vote to approve or reject it. And whenever nine of the existing 13 approve it, it becomes in an effect for those nine or more states. All right. Another way of looking at this is Article 5 of the Constitution clearly lays out the ability to create a convention. 
no convention called under Article 5 can, by definition, be a runaway convention. Looking at the lost rights argument, if we alter it, we might lose certain rights that we value. First of all, we should not shy away from a vigorous debate over which rights ought to be protected in the Constitution. And again, experience, as the framers all noted, experience over time should help guide our decisions on this matter. Right? We should not be locked into something simply because we thought, well, that's what they put in there and it should never be altered. We should be guided by our experience and what society has, has learned, the technological change, and be guided in that process in enshrining certain rights in the Constitution. Second, it's unlikely that the American public would approve alterations to the Constitution that threatened broadly cherished rights. At the end of the day, again, under Article 5, the convention is only permitted to propose changes. Any changes created by that or proposed changes created by that convention must be approved by three quarters of the states. And so nothing coming out of that convention is automatically a change to the Constitution. It is simply a proposed change that must be approved by. So there are safeguards built into this process to prevent the stripping of rights that the people broadly want included. Finally, the vagueness argument. And it is, it is true. Article 5 gives no specifics on how to conduct such a convention. So I'm going to propose my own ideas. Uh, and we'll see how far that gets me, all right? Uh, so where would the convention be located? My recommendation is to locate it somewhere in the central United States for a couple of reasons. Number one, easier access to get to. I don't have to, if I hold it in Washington, D.C., where everything else is, that's a large amount of travel for people from the western side of the United States. If, again, if I hold it in the western United States, the people from the east, somewhere centrally located in the U.S. seems to be uh, more appropriate. Also, holding it there as opposed to a center of power like Washington, D.C., uh, speaks more to the convention as a convention of the people and not a convention of uh, elite rulers. Second, I would propose that delegates should be elected to the convention by the people of the states. Right? Not appointed by the legislature, not appointed by another government official, but elected directly by the people. I would also prohibit any U.S. or state official from serving in the convention. Why, you might ask? The main reason is because these folks are already caught up in all of the partisan divisions that are occurring in the country. It'll be very hard for them to lay those at the door and walk into a convention without them. The other reason is we have a broad amount of talent and understanding and wisdom in the people, and we should allow that to emerge within a convention and not limit it to simply people who've been able to win votes or who have been close to power and have been able to uh, get appointed to certain positions. The delegates should also be compensated for their work and I would say they ought to be compensated at the same rate that members of Congress are. Their work is no less important. As far as apportionment goes, I would apportion delegates based on their electoral college apportionment. So the votes that each state receives in the electoral college would be the votes they would be assigned to the convention. This is primarily, but not exclusively, based on population. So uh, if you look at the way the electoral college is, the, the way it is decided how many votes a state gets, they take the number of members each state has in the House of Representatives, uh, and they just add the two senators. And so I think that using that model would be sufficient. It does give less populous states a little bit more voice. Uh, so it's not a purely proportionate, as the House of Representatives is, based on population, but it is primarily based on population. Um, I would give the convention about two years 
to come up with this. The first convention, they completed their work in roughly six, six months, maybe not quite six months. I should take that back. So uh, from May of 1787 to September of 87, uh, the issues are a little bit more complex today. They might need a little bit more time to consider them. Uh, but I would give them that about that time frame. That is one congressional term, by the way. Two years is one congressional term. I think that uh, is reasonable when we're asking people to redesign or revise uh, our current governing document. An important reminder, as I mentioned a couple of times, anything that comes out of such a convention must be approved by three quarters of the states. And so whatever goes on there, it is important to note that there is that back wall, if you will. One other thing I will note, a lot of people sometimes will say, well, we shouldn't have a convention because we're too divided. And there's no doubt that there is great division within the country. My contention to that is this process of examining our founding document could A, both be a unifying process, right? one that brings us together to say, how do we want to live with one another peacefully? Uh, and even if no significant revisions were made, just the process of saying we looked at it, we don't think it needs changes, gives our generation an opportunity to pass judgment on this document that was written 230 some years ago. So even failing to make significant amendments, the process of holding a convention has value. With that, I'll open it up to any questions anyone might have. All right. I have so many. Okay, that's okay. Wouldn't, wouldn't this be a very interesting thing to do uh, at the college among the students as a, as a, as a at mock prototype? Sure, I mean, sure. Absolutely. And um, one thing that people don't know about Oklahoma state government, our state constitution requires that the legislature put uh, on the ballot every 10 years, every decade, uh, the opportunity for folks to call a state convention for the rewriting of the state constitution. Now, we have not done that in a couple of decades. Uh, and there's been some discussion about, about that. Uh, but it is required in our state constitution that we re-examine our own state constitution periodically. Uh, so yes, I think something at the college level, I think looking at something at the state level too would help be a model for what we could do. Yes? Define runaway uh, convention. So that is a convention that has no constraints on what it would propose. Uh, or how it would set up the approval process. That's, that's generally what people mean by a runaway convention, one that uh, is unrestrained in what it can do, right? Uh, much like the original convention became. Yes, sir. So you're saying we couldn't have put duct tape on them? Okay, uh, I'll retract that portion of my, my statement, yes. Yes? Um, you know, with some of the recent Supreme Court and state rulings, we're seeing a lot of movement of individuals from one state to another. Mm -hmm. They don't like a particular position in a state, and so they're moving to another. I'm thinking, of course, particularly about the abortion ruling. Uh -huh. from. With something like this, people would not have the option to move, you know, country. Would, would there be movement to territories? Territories are not bound by this, right? Territories are unique in the sense that they are uh, bound by the U.S. Constitution, uh, but they do not have the same rights as states do, right? So territories have no representation in U.S. Congress, uh, although they do get electoral votes. I'm not sure how those exactly work. Uh, and the U.S. government can exert much more direct control over U.S. territories than they can over the states. So a little bit different arrangement, 
Um, this would not preclude people from moving from one state to another uh, unless we put that in the Constitution, but it might re reduce the motivation for doing so, right? If, uh, if whether you're talking about the abortion issue, gun control, other issues, freedom of speech issues, uh, education issues, uh, many of those are not bound by the current constitution, right? State governments under our system have a wide range of uh, ability to impact their own laws and regulations on these. Uh, were we to insert some of these, clarify some of these uh, amendments in a way that could get three quarters of the states to approve, uh, that might change. But right now the balance of power is such that the, the federal government on many of these issues is limited in its ability to affect whatever change a majority in Congress or a president in office wants to see happen. You were talking about, uh, and maybe I missed it, but the three last amendments. Uh -huh. I know that one of them was how many terms the president could uh, serve. Right. What were the other two with Nixon and Bush Sr.? So the 26th Amendment was passed uh, in 71. It was the one that lowered the voting age. So it, it set basically, I think for the first time, a voting age for the population, and it set it at age 18. So that was the 26th Amendment. The 27th Amendment has a very interesting history. It was actually proposed in 1790 as part of those bills that moved through as part of the Bill of Rights. And it says that if Congress votes itself a pay raise, they cannot, that pay raise cannot take effect until an intervening election has occurred. So if Congress voted themselves a pay raise today, that pay raise would not go in effect until the elections of next year occurred. Yeah, uh, and so that's what that one did. Uh, the 20th Amendment, uh, I'd have to go back, I can't quite remember what that was. The 19th, every, at least half the population should know what the 19th Amendment did. Yes? That's correct, right? Uh, uh, and then the, the 22nd Amendment is the one that you were thinking of that limited uh, a president to two, two full terms. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Everybody's ready to go hold another convention. I'm just going to assume that. Because, yes? Mm -hmm. There are. Uh, there, it, within the Constitution itself, it limits the federal government in, in areas. Uh, most of the time, the way the federal government gets around that is not by directly mandating things, but by throwing large sums of money at the states and saying, we want you to do this, and if you will do this, we'll give you billions and billions of dollars to do it. Uh, and so state government officials who like to spend money they didn't have to tax their people for generally take that bargain. But mandates are happening. They are, but they can only happen in areas that the federal government is authorized to act, right? Uh, and so, uh, and when there's a question about that, the courts become the final arbiter, right? And the courts have to interpret the Constitution to, in a way, that says, is this a proper power exercised by the national government according to the Constitution or not? Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, the Constitution does have the Supremacy Clause, right? And so the Supremacy Clause says that the Constitution and all laws made and all treaties made under it is the supreme law of the land. Uh, and so interpreting that can be very, very challenging sometimes. Uh, not everything, as we talked about in Article 5, not everything is precisely clear. Uh, you want a little bit of wiggle room, right? And you don't want a constitution that tries to get into policy making, right? That can cause a whole bunch of problems. Uh, 
So you want a, pro a constitution that gives a framework, a process of how things will be done, but you don't necessarily want it to be super precise and super detailed on every single thing that might come up because then that constrains the hands of uh, the elected officials to address issues as they arise. Uh, and so you have to have a bit of flexibility in that document for design. That's one of the reasons why the U.S. Constitution is the longest surviving written constitution in the world because it does have that flexibility built in. It does give each generation uh, a w means of interpreting it slightly different than prior generations. Anything else? No? Then I am going to uh, let you guys disperse and uh, go forth and call for a constitutional convention. Write your elected official now. I'm sure you'll all get right on that. Thank you.